Great to be working with you, Roland, um, Mishari, uh, Hong Fook, Mario, and the team. Thought I'd take the opportunity this year just to spend about maybe 20 minutes on uh, sharing what's been happening in the in the open source space around Diem, as it's called, and um, and give you a bit of a, a taster for that. Um, really personal curiosity, kind of looking at the tech, looking at some of the media announcements of where this has been going. So I'm going to give you a bit of background and then get into some of the, the practical playing around and applications with a demo and a bit of a deep dive. Um, but great, and thank you for joining, um, because it is, of course, somewhat even contradictory to be calling it an open source network when we've uh, when it's when when historically this concept of Libra, as it was called, was backed by by Facebook, and that came out somewhere around 2019 already. So it's already been two years where um, you know there's been talk about a, a, a network and and Facebook itself as the social media company being involved in in this payment infrastructure, um, and of course we saw a lot of regulatory pushback. There was a lot of challenge around crypto custody uh, custody as a whole lack of regulation and definitely lack of approvals. And so that kind of piqued my interest and I've been following the story for a while, um, purely because it's very difficult to, to marry the two, right? Between the unregulated space and then having access to a large audience and being able to bring them the convenience of everything that is crypto related um, without all the headaches of key management, um, you know, wallets with, with without all the blockchain complexity behind it. And of course, as soon as a company stands up and says, we're gonna do something in the space, it attracts a lot of attention. So with that background, I thought I'd look at this open source financial network as they call it. Um, and Libra more recently then rebranded, right? Rebranded into uh, a new project name, which is called Diem. And that's quite recent, that was just in December. So Diem Association um, is effectively an, a neutral body that's overseeing this project, this network and these currencies. Um, What's also been quite telling is that um, some large names have gotten behind this initiative, and the most recent one is our own Singapore Tamasek Holdings, uh, which is to join the association. It's quite an unusual move because it brings quite a bit of credibility to the network, at least the project. Um, maybe the most telling is that, unlike a lot of other projects, it was redesigned to be a permissioned blockchain network. So as opposed to open nodes run by anybody everywhere, um, the network has been interestingly designed to to be more centralized but still give the transparency and the access to to really anybody on, on the fringes if we look at the network um it, it kind of has a, a a validator full node network in the in the middle which is this purple block where kind of authorized permission net nodes join the network and share information amongst themselves and replicate state so it's Byzantine fault tolerant but then beneath that we've got public nodes that can subscribe to the network and effectively synchronize the state. And that's interesting because it means that there's transparency in the data coming out, but the actual core of it is kind of controlled and restricted. And then the core provides these APIs that anybody can talk to, such as, for instance, clients who then perform transactions on the network, which then again get replicated through, through the blockchain infrastructure. So this is all public information that everything I'm gonna be talking about is, is in the open. And so it's out of that curiosity that um, you can get some access to it. I'm not saying it's at the fully ready state yet for you know easy adoption by every every you know, retail <laughs> or every every engineer it takes a bit of digging, but um, it's it's certainly improving. Um, what's interesting about the network is it's got kind of different types of addresses, and they've done this for very valid reasons. Is to say you know we're really going to create a wallet, an account address that is 16 bytes in length, and that is your primary identifier. Now. On top of that, you can have sub addresses that can be for one time use or that can be assigned to single wallet. So effectively, you can have a, a, a main address that can be that, that can allow for sub addressing just for separation of functions. But most unique about this is an account identifier, which is effectively a, a BEC32 kind of hashed or call it, call it, call it um, you know, translated network address. And, and these addresses um, effectively consolidate the, the main account address and the sub address into a a wallet address, which which can be used universally for things like merchant payments or other type of transactions, and so they even come up with a bit of a naming convention. I thought I'd share this because it's relevant in in how we then use the network. And then, of course, these account identifiers can be put into these URIs, which then can be passed along in mobile apps or in blinking or other type of web applications to interact with that counterparty. So, if you're doing a peer-to-peer -peer transfer or you're doing a 
a merchant payment. It would be through this um, intent identifier. So a little bit interesting in the sense that they've separated these addresses, also allowing you to change your private and public key, uh, if you, your private key on the account that you're managing without changing the account address on the network. So there's almost a separation between what is your, your encryption keys that you can rotate versus the address that you're using on the network, which you know, remains the same. And so unlike Bitcoin or Ethereum, where those you know, the two are the same, the private public key is your identifier, here you've effectively got a proxy account ad address that you can repurpose, and then a separate set of keys that can be rotated. Um, and again, that, that means that you, 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 you keep your identity while keeping control over your keys. Um, if we look at network, um, published some, some JSON RPC methods, which are just a basic set of those for public access, and those are the ones we're going to be playing with a bit. Um, you can submit instructions. You can look at transaction histories. You can query an account. Um, you can get the account transaction history of, of, a, of an account identifier um, and various metadata of the network. So again, it kind of shows that yes, there's a robustness and a, and a richness in the data that's coming out of the network, even if it is somewhat centrally run, perhaps comparable to Binance Smart Chain, for example, which is a permissioned uh, parity Ethereum network. First off, I think what we're going to do is just spend some time running a local node. And so um, what we've done is we've pulled the uh, source code from, from GitHub. Um, it is in Rust. And we're just going to run this node. And so there's two parts. That there's obviously the node and then local host, um, kind, of, kind of the client side connecting to the local host. That can either be through a CLI or it can be through an HTTP um, a call through Postman or to, to the JSON RPC. What I'll just do is I'll just switch to um, to my, my Ubuntu instance and just show you what that looks like. So just giving that a moment to load up. Um, and so first off, what we'll do is just simply, you know, this has already been pulled. So if I go, if I just have a look at just kind of bring this from testnet, it's my latest uh, pull from the uh, GitHub DM um, project and just into the branch testnet. And quite simple after the initial build, right, is just to, to actually run the DM node and with this parameter test, which, which kind of spins up the test, uh, test node. Um, so this is the simplest kind of exercise just to run a local instance. What we'll do later on in this kind of walkthrough is see how we then connect that up to the test net, and you'll see the amount of data that then starts kind of publishing through. But in the local node, what we'll see is just obviously basic logging information, configuration that's being used. Um, it's got certain keys in it. Uh, we can look at that. And some root keys that are just generated locally for the uh, the instance. And then this waypoint is, a, is an identifier on the network in terms of the state. And so in terms of here, it just spits it out. In the public network, that's actually published centrally. And we will download that in order to synchronize our local node with the, the, the validator network. As you can see, the JSON RPC is up. Then it's got a, it's just exposing a TCP IP port for, um, for access. And then chain is, is testing. So quite straightforward. Um, what we've got to do is we've got to now put this in, in order to connect to the node, we're going to pick up another instance, another console here, where we're going to pick up the, uh, the CLI. And um, we're just putting in some commands here. So I'm going to run this client node on the testing network. I've got to connect to the instance of the mint effectively the instance that we're connecting to in terms of the uh, the mint key. So I'm just going to copy that from here, uh, which is my mint key over here. And um, just taking that into my uh, into my my, uh, my my local configuration. Next, I've got to specify what uh, the JSON endpoint that I'm going to connect to. So that will be my RPC API. And lastly, I've got to synchronize my waypoint. And this is, again, just for the documentation out there. Um, of me connecting into this local node network. So actually just client server you know, between the two. And what you see here is, uh, let me just make that a little bit larger for you, is effectively a um, local client running uh, where I've got a number of commands that are listed out on the left-hand side. So that's quite neat. And now I can do different things. I can, like, I mean, I can just obviously ask for the help, which is my menu here. Uh, I can look at for information on the blockchain network. So it tells me that this is a test network and I've got a validator running. Um, and so it is in the testing chain. What I can do is I can, for instance, go here into the accounts submenu, 
I can, for instance, see, I can list accounts or recover my seeds, or I can write to a seed file just for testing purposes. Quite simply, I can, for instance, go, you know, account and create a new account. Um, what you see here is that create an internal account, and that's just an identifier. And if I list out the accounts, I can see, okay, here's a local account. Um, it's a private key that's shared to me for my testing purposes. What I can also do then is I can effectively um, mint some coins, and let's say I want to add a thousand coins. Um, to this account, and I'm just going to use the primary uh, kind of index identify zero. Um, okay, in this case, I actually need to get my currency right, XUS, um, and it's connecting to a faucet, and it's going to mint that, and it's going to put that into my account. Yeah, let's see if that comes out right. Um, okay, and it's going to be putting those into my account. So if I go, if I list my account now, I can see. This account has changed from being a local account into a persisted account. And also, if I then query the balance, let's say query balance on account identifier zero, I've got a thousand uh, XUSD coins in this wallet. And so I can do that again, right? So I can I can effectively also create another account and then just create another one. Um, there we go. I might, for instance, in this case, just under the account add a currency, um, you know, which is XUSD uh, XUS um, to the second account. So again, I can query that balance and say, I'll query balance of the, first, of the, of the second account. Oh, that does not exist yet. Um, so that's still seen as a local account. So maybe I just need to mint some coins for that to get it running. Um, mint ID zero, maybe maybe just uh, 10 tokens, XUS, that one. Again, I'm just going to top up the second account. And what we can now do is move between the accounts. So the, the chain behind the scene is already running all of this. And if I do, for instance, now a transfer from zero to you know, ID one of just five coins um, has been submitted, and I can query that transaction. Um, so here I can just query that transaction. And I can see, okay, that, that was executed. And if I query the balance now from of the second account, which was um, run, I can say, okay, let me see, okay, now the balance is up to 15. So we already have this kind of blockchain mode running, it's local, it, you know, running through this RPC interface, and if I now, um, now look at my account identifiers, I can go here and I can pull this out. I can also switch to my um, node and I can say, okay, I want to query that um, on the local network. Um, and I got some, uh, I didn't get a response on that one, sorry, let me go back to this method here. I want to query that on my local node. And I get some, inf some information back. So what the, the real test here is, you know, there's some code base that's been worked on, it's been supported by the, uh, the association, it's been making good progress. We can actually see that you know, these things are coming together between accounts, the network, the transactions, the faucets, and all the rest. Now, what I've done is I've just moved ahead and I'll talk to just running a, spinning up a full node. What this means is we're going to subscribe to the public network, uh, we'll call it the test net, as a replica full node as per this command over here. That's kind of cool. Um, as I mentioned, I just got to reset my waypoint. So if I now head on my local node, I'm just going to Move my waypoint and just, you know, just pull that from the network. I've now got this this uh, waypoint that, that indicates the current state of that network the identifier, and I can now start up my local node. And if I start up my local node now with a different configuration, pointing to the public network, you know, we can start seeing a fair bit of activity already um, with it synchronizing. And what you'll see right now is a fair amount of data coming through. Uh, mo maybe most telling is that. If I look at the amount of data I've already replicated here, um, we're up to you know, 4.8 gigs worth of data in my uh, in my local data file, and you will see more of the transactions coming through in the background as the network uh, starts synchronizing. You can see these synchronization requests and then var various updates confirming you know, that the blocks are being passed around and I'm receiving the state from the from the main network. Why is this cool? Why is this relevant? Is well, we're obviously seeing the traffic go through, so this is it's not simulated. This is this is real traffic flowing. We can see the amount of data that came through. So last night I was on one gig, and now I'm up to four and a half gigs and running. Um, if we just look at the configuration of the kind of of the full node pointer, you know, we're running a full node. We've set it up to point to a local data directory. Um, for some reason in the testnet discovery method is none, so there's no dynamic discovery. If you turn it on, it comes up with a lot of like private um, kind of host names that are not particularly resolvable at this stage. Um, yes, it, it certainly is propagating its peers. 
Um, and so in this testnet setup, I simply connect to the testnet public endpoint on a certain port, and it handshakes. What's interesting is that the documentation on the GitHubs is not always synced into master um, or even, even in the main branches. So you've got to go into the test branches to find the documentation. If you're in the wrong branch, pick up some bad configurations and it, it, it'll take you a long time to figure out what's what. So just make sure you're in the right branch if you're going to play with this. Effectively, it is a public network that we're connecting to. So it's being novel. And as I shared, you know, it connects, it works. And there's lots of data coming through, and it's nicely JSON serialized. It's all written in Rust, so it runs pretty well. Um, and then it'll just keep on collecting all the data in the state from the public network. This is what I highlighted, you know, connected peers. We can see the nodes. Um, we see the synchronization requests. And then after a block of transactions have come down, you know, here it's synchronizing a 1,000 transactions, and the sync status is then finished. And there's lots of traffic coming through. Um, so net net it's participating in the in the main network now why that's interesting is because again if i if i go to my my my, my cli and i change this to um to join the test net effectively as i've just demonstrated earlier we can also do the same on the test net and i can for instance query balances what i'm going to do is i'm going to recover my seed uh from from a wallet uh or wallet from a seed address and again, I've got these 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 keys here, and if I query that, you know, oh, let's say here I go query the balance of of this address. In the public network, well, there's a fairly large amount of coins in this wallet. Uh, just mindful of time, stepping us through. What I can then also do is I can go to the test net uh, again on the same endpoints. So I'm just going to use the same address and query that. Um, and again, I, I can do some transactions between different wallets. So if I were to do a wallet transaction, let's say I go, I do a, a Transfer, uh, transfer of, let me just have a look here, transfer from the sender, which is my, uh, let's say, one to that one of 10 XUS. Let's see if that works. Oops, uh, easy transfer. Okay, the sending account does not exist, so we'll have to go do something else. Um, what I wanted to show you on further to is we can now look at uh, something very cool, which is the DM Blockchain Explorer. And so here, for instance, I can put in this. Um, put in my local address and I find that this has done a fair number of transactions on the network I can drill down into that I'll be able to see you know my my private wallet address is here so that's from my my locally generated pair and if I wanted to transfer to this recipient address or maybe the other way around let me just do that from my CLI I'm going to transfer um, say from my account zero to this recipient which I don't own maybe seven x us just so we can identify that okay and that was submitted what's interesting now is if we go to the test network explorer we'll probably see that at the top of the queue uh, a lot of transactions going through <laughs> so if we if we have a look at the recipient you know here's my seven uh, that are in flight just a, within a minute ago and let's see where they came from yes they indeed came from from my originating node so you know the network is coming together um in terms of you know having the visibility and having the insight as to what's going on, lots of different keys and, and hashes. And what's interesting about the approach here is that the ability to move money between wallets itself is a is is a smart contract programmed you know move um, kind of logic. Um, so maybe I'm using that terminology wrong. So move is the smart contract language, and to move money between you know two coins, which in this case are XUSD. There is a smart contract doing that, and so that sets the foundation for a lot more development and innovation to come. Um, but today we're just playing down, playing around with these synthetic uh, type nodes. Um, having said that, um, the test net is up, and I think there's some very interesting references and things to play around with. One that I found there, the association publishing is the wallet and the merchant. Uh, both are kind of discoverable by just you know, playing around in, in their in their documentation in their browser. What that means is if we have a look at um, kind of the wallet side, let me just find which, uh, which, which, which reference I can use. Yes, here, the DM wallet. I can now log into this. And um, it's not quite as live as it looks to be on the front end. So it's going on in the background. What you can see is that here's a wallet, and I've signed up for it. I've just created a balance, and I've sent some transactions um, through the network. Um, and so here I can see that I've actually um, transacted in what is effectively these derived identifiers, right? These are the BEH32 um, 
kind of encoded identifiers. Um, it's a bit telling, it's a bit of playing around here because you can't actually see the underlying network address. So what I've had to do here is literally just you know, take this identifier and reverse it. So just jumping back to the documentation, there's a CLI where I can use a function like that. So I can say address from back 32 address, and I'm just going to try decode that. Um, and so it codes that into its underlying address, which is here. And if I were now to take that address back into the DM Explorer, I can see, OK, this, this, this address has done a number of transactions. Um, the reason I'm just calling it out is because while it's this public key pair that's being used here actually has 4 million USD uh, allocated to it, um, and I've just transferred those $7 in, Actually, within the wallet front end, there's a bit of, a bit of, I guess, illustration here of how it should work and what a wallet address would look like. But it's kind of cool because you can go and add a balance. And I can choose my funding source, which is just simulated. And let's say I want to add 50 USD to this wallet, and I confirm that transaction. So that was done, um, and now that is reflected here. It does actually publish that onto the blockchain network. So if I refresh this page for this wallet. We find that the 50 has been added. So, a one way view, but nonetheless, the network is indeed powering the transactions. Um, and this is relevant, and why this goes back to kind of the DM association getting involved is because the same thing is now possible on the merchant side, which is not quite clear to me yet how one exactly transacts. So, you want to see transactions moving from a wallet into perhaps a merchant side, and you can perhaps choose which currency that is in, scan a QR code, or perhaps you know, use a different type of wallet. And what you'll see in the bottom of the screen is this, um, this DM identifier, which is that unique address with an amount tied to it. So net net, some interesting playing around, um, worthwhile kind of keeping an eye on it. Um, very interesting to look at the move smart contracts. And then there's some add-ins and other developer tools that are emerging. So it's interesting to get behind the uh, project a bit more um, as perhaps there's some interest. So just to close out, I think we're just 25 minutes exactly. Um, exciting new network, uh, open source, a lot of good code out there in the public, and it's backed by the Alliance. Um, there's certainly a look towards the future with, uh, with regard to regulators and kind of the service providers and the, uh, and the move programming language. Uh, the technical documentation is maturing, so it is uh, experimental, and you kind of have to get your hands dirty, but it is, it is taking shape. Um, and then you know, the get best guidance is GitHub and developer nodes. So the media mentions that we'll see more activity in 2021. I hope that was uh, somewhat informative on kind of what's happening in the open source related to uh, the DM network. Uh, thank Michelle. you very much, Thorsten. Um, that was uh, very interesting. Um, could, could you do us a favor and copy those links and put it in the shared notes under, um, under, under the, um, the topic? And so we could uh, take a look at it. Um, so just uh, just uh, uh, well, um, a question so far uh, from me. Um, yeah. So okay, so so um, just to uh, look at DM, and before that we uh, we we looked at uh, at Hyperledger. Um, so what are the um, um, being, time being limited? Why would I choose to spend time exploring one project or the other? Can you give us some insights on that? Right. On how do they differ? Yeah, very good question. I think I think very valid question on the basis that um, you know the the, the the hyperledger and such projects, of course, are building infrastructure and tech that will be deployed, um, you know, by corporates and 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 other users for their own purposes of sharing data. I think what we're seeing here is more of a a financial infrastructure that is that is looking to effectively build a centralized platform to which many other ecosystem partners will then join, and and that'll take time because. Unlike something like Hyperledger, which is there for data, um, perhaps for securing you know, transactions between institutions, um, you know this 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 looks more like a financial system, um, and and so you wouldn't be able to just adopt this for for your own personal use. But I think where the opportunity is for engineers and developers to look more closely at Move as a programming language, well, for smart contracts, and secondly, then to think about what are potentially the use cases that we can build on top of the DM network if you were to have marketplaces, if you were to have e-commerce platforms, if you were to have uh, booking sites or, or, or lending or remittance or anything else that is perhaps then more financial services orientated, which is transactional, as opposed to perhaps something that is more kind of quarter, 
Hyperledger, I don't know, uh, Big Chain DB, and other blockchains, which is more data orientated. So, so would you require, say, um, a, a bank to be, um, I don't know, a, um, a host for uh, for Libra? Will it be connected to a bank? To bank? So, what, what, what I've seen and studied on the on the on the architecture side is that it's not a it's not a um, public network in the sense that anybody can just come up and 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 be a node that perhaps you know stakes some coins and mints some uh, some some crypto uh, and and then um, you know, kind of kind of balances like. Bitcoin with its 10,000, 12,000 nodes. I think here, a bit the opposite is that you can participate in the network as a, as, as kind of a recipient of the data and you could you know, initiate transactions, but through intermediaries. It might not be banks, it might be you know, other ecosystem players. Um, but I think the, the, in, the intent here is to have a very clear landscape of who is who and who's participating, as opposed to the crypto world where it's really in the unknown. And mm -hmm. and I think that's where the regulators are most concerned. So so who determines who can participate in the DM network? Okay, so a good question. What, what I think is is being, really coming into shape and, and is worth um worth looking into is the uh, the the DM association and the way that they are setting themselves up. Right, so very public uh, with 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 kind of their model um, with their kind of approach in terms of they go to market and what they want to address in terms of the challenge that they're taking on. What you'll find is that. Um, you know, really just looking at it from, from, from what's public and what's on the surface and what's been published is, um, is, is that, you know, that, that, that the association, as they call it, wants to bring that, that kind of stability and that control. Um, and, and that means that you'll have this consortium, you'll have people that get together, very smart people. Uh, what's very impressive is their, their, um, their kind of protocol improvements that they publish, their, their DIPs, um, in terms of the governance and, 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 you know, the, the kind of the, features that they're adding through a kind of formal methodology of accepting and voting on upgrades and protocols, which, you know, you, you might see in some other crypto projects, but probably not to this level of rigor and, and, and diligence. So you'll probably find that it'll be a very well-run tech stack together with a kind of very formal methodology on governance and change control, and then open it up for the public to participate bit different where a lot of the other projects are trying to bring the governance in as a I'd say almost as, a, as an optional um, while they're more focused on the crypto assets themselves and, and the use cases uh, so a bit, a bit of a different view and take to blockchain okay well uh, uh, very interesting the, um, all this blockchain is, is quite interesting we, we're still unsure right whether it will lead to uh, to freedom or, or tyranny I think the, the jury is out of that. It can it can go both ways. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so just just a quick question about the stack. Um, I sort of remember uh, Libra when when they started. They um they I think they mentioned that they were writing everything on Elixir. I noticed that you're using Rust. Do you, do, do you yes. know like did, did the stack change? Oh, I'm not quite sure on the on the on some of the evolution of of the stack. Um, what I found is in in the GitHub that there's lots of resources coming together um, on top of that what you're finding now is that um, a lot of different language support so there's CLIs SDKs in Python there's there's SDKs in in, in, in Java um, you know what you'll find is that it's quite an active community um, Golang, you know and and so on the on the edge you'll find that there's a lot of the the front ends or the clients being developed in order to support wallets and web portals and interfaces um, on the core um, the engine is being put out in, in Rust, and I, I'm not sure if that's a big part of the kind of three-year, yeah, maybe two-year history that, that this uh, initiative has had. And also since kind of the separation from Facebook, where it was, into this kind of separate standalone project called, called DM, which means uh, to, to today, tomorrow, in, in Latin. So it's got a, <laughs> a Latin root. Okay, wonderful. Uh, thank, uh, thank you very much.